Okay, friends, books out, phones away. We are today starting and discussing Mashiach in a lot more detail. Finally. What page are we on? Okay. Let's talk Mashiach. Let's start with a number which I think I've mentioned before, and that is the number 6,000. We said world history can take a maximum of 6,000 years, and those 6,000 years are divided up into three groups of 2,000 and 2,000 and 2,000. The first 2,000 are called... It's a borrowed term, tohu vavohu, which is a borrowed term from Bereshit, which means absolute and complete disorder, disorder, complete mess, literally my kids' bedrooms every single morning, just like a bomb hit it. Chaos. Chaos. Chaotic. Absolutely chaotic. Comes along. Avram Avinu, in the Jewish year, 1948 is the year, the Jewish year, that he was born. And he starts off the second 2000, which are called the 2000, the Alpayim, which is 2000 of Torah. He starts that train going until the Jewish year 2448, when the Torah was given to the Jewish people. So now in the second 2000, that's called the 2000 of Torah, because Avram Avinu was born at the beginning of it, and the Torah was given in this 2000. The last 2000 are refer- referred to as the 2000 of Yamot HaMashiach. Now, that's hard to understand because Mashiach has not come yet. Actually, we don't know who he is and what he's going to do and everything else. But one thing's for sure, he hasn't arrived yet. This means that within this 2000, Mashiach can arrive. So we have a beginning, we have a middle, and we have an end. Like any good story or any good joke, there's three parts to it. The first is the thesis, then we have the antithesis, and then we end up with a synthesis. It all comes together. That's the key elements. When was the first two, the last 2000 start? So that starts at the end of this 2000. No, I know when the, like, the times are set. 4001. Or when did the, la- the second 2000? Well, that started with <laughs> the coming of. No, and it, it ended. This is the, the, the structure of the temple period. Around that time, yeah. That's when the gullet really started to kick in, yeah. Are we in the last 2000? Yes, we're in the last 2000. We're well, well into it. That's pretty crazy. Yeah, we're 5783. We're pretty close to the final 6,000. So when is he coming? Where is he? Okay, okay, slow down, Anya. Slow down. Can I have one more question? Can you just, the last one, Vamat Hamashiach? Yomot Hamashiach, yeah. Is that just translated as the days of Mashiach. Yeah, most of Mashiach is days of Mashiach, yeah. Okay. Yeah. It's a lot of questions. We haven't started yet. Yeah. No. No, 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 no. The days we have, there's a, there is an opinion of 130 or so missing years, but that's been justified. So we're going to go with the exact calendar that we are today. That means we're in 5783. Comes along Isaiah the prophet in chapter 60. And Isaiah the prophet at the end of the chapter gives us two very important words, which we're going to revisit these words a number of times because they're very important because they make a big, big difference to our story. And the words of Isaiah the prophet, I don't know what the two words are by any chance. Be'ito. Be'ito. Ahi. Shena, which means in its time, Achishena. That's a tricky word to translate, but I'm going to do it anyway. Vito means he's going to come in its time. 
most commentators, including the Ramban, say that means Bito means in its time means by the six thousandth. He must come by then. It's a given. The world must change by the six thousandth year. Achishena, however, means that the Gemara tells us he can come earlier. So there is an outer time, which is the Beito, in its time. And by the way, we're going to see that these two times aren't just two different times. They're two different ways that Mashiach can come. And one is better than the other. We're going to get there. But just let me download it into your heads right now. So you have it in your hippocampus. So later on, we can revisit this. Achishana means that we have the ability to expedite, to easy pass, to Amazon Prime the arrival of Mashiach and make him come earlier. How do we do that? We are going to see. <coughs> but it's a given. And that is the words of Isaiah chapter 60. And that verse, you'll see, is at the back of your books. Be'ito achishana. He can come at its time or he can come earlier. Now, this is different from every other galut. We discussed last class there are four exiles the Jewish people have gone through. Each one of them you could do nothing about. You went into galut, the clock has to tick out, and then Mashiach can arrive. This galut, the last galut, is different. We have the ability, through our actions, to make it come earlier. If that's not true, then why are we praying for Mashiach? There's no point praying, because as soon as the clock ticks out, he comes, that's the end of it. The fact that we have the audacity to pray for Mashiach means that Hashem left open a window, a big window, that's going to allow for Mashiach to come earlier, and that is dependent upon our actions. That's the Achishena version, which means that we have the power to bring Mashiach. Crucially important. Let's have a look at the words of the Maral of Prague on page 51. He's going to quote the Gemara that we just mentioned of the 6,000 years, and he's going to give his understanding of it. Not too different to what we saw. We saw already the Gemara tells us in the Vodah Zarah, Shnel Paimot Mashiach, the final 2,000 years of world history are years that Mashiach could arrive in. Pirush, what does that mean? Hazman Acharon, he says, the last thing. The last time whom Yochad Le'emot Mashiach is open to the... It doesn't mean Mashiach has come. It's open to the arrival of Mashiach. Ki azman acharon hu ha Because the final part of anything is the hashlama. It is the final part that brings it all together. Just like... And this is a perfect analogy, by the way. Just like the punchline brings an understanding and appreciation for the joke that comes before it, or any story has an ending... That ending only makes sense or has any impact on us after you've been through the beginning of the story and the middle of the story. You can't start a joke with a punchline. Like, you know, some people do. That's like, that's terrible. You've ruined the entire joke. So to all of old history, he says, has to go through a beginning and a middle and an end. So if you remember, we started this course months ago. I don't know how long ago it was. In Gan Eden. Gan Eden is over here at the beginning. And really, world history is us making our way through. And all of world history divides up into three sections. We are boop, boop, right over there. But we're going back to Gan Eden, to the Garden of Eden, before the hate, before the sin of Adam and Chava. That's what we're going to. So really, it's all coming back full circle. But we have achieved it. Okay. In other words, says the Maharal of Prague, anything which happens at the end of the process is the completion and perfection of that process. In other words, it's not just like randomly he's coming at some point. It's all related to what happened before. Everything in world history, this is crucial, everything in world history happened in order to bring us to the arrival of Mashiach. Every war, every pogrom, every crusade, holocaust, and all the good stuff too, it all comes for a purpose to take us to the end. It's not unrelated to history. Mechshiach is going to come, and part of the messianic drama and conclusion is going to be related to everything that happens before. Therefore, the end time is de designated for the arrival of the King Mashiach, for he's going to bring the entire world to completion. The entire world, the whole world is going to be one. That's important. Bayomahu, Yadanayachad, Ushmo, 
echad, as we say at the end of Aleinu. That's a quote from the prophets. In those days, Yashem echad, Ushma echad. He'll be one and his name will be one. What does that mean he's one? He's one right now. He's one right now for us, but he's going to be one for everyone at the end of days. That's actually going to be Mashiach's job, to bring absolute unity throughout the entire world. Bayomahu ya Adonai echad, Ushmo echad. There's going to be an absolute unity. There's going to be no disagreement. Absolute agreement that this is Mashiach and we're at the end of days. Therefore, it is fitting, he says, this King Mashiach, and we already discussed last class, we'll mention it again, why he's called Melech HaMashiach. He's got to come at the end of days. You're only going to be fitting to have the conclusion of world history at the end of history, as it's referred to in the Chumash as Acharit Hayamim. Acharit Hayamim. That's really what we're talking about now. That's where everything has led us. Acharit Hayamim. Now, that does not mean I don't like the end of days because people think that it all comes to an end. It means the completion. The completion. The world to come. It's a transition. It's going to be started with, we're going to see over the next coming weeks, a lot of challenge and difficulty. Because anything must go through difficulty, just like childbirth. And this is not my analogy. This is the analogy the rabbis give it. Just like childbirth gets more and more difficult, and more painful until you get to the contractions, and then life comes, so too, all of world history is going to get more and more challenging. What those challenges are is going to be a dispute, some physical and some psychological and some spiritual. There's going to be a major challenge at the end of days that we're going to see and that's going to lead to the leda the birth the birth of mashiach the expression that is used to describe the analogy i just gave you want to write down is hevle hamashiach hevle hamashiach refers to the birth pains of mashiach that is the analogy that is given hevle hamashiach that things are going to get progressively more difficult before the final birth of Mashiach's arrival will come. That is a metaphor, but it's a very apt one. Refers to the end of days. This idea of labor and birth and contractions, and that is the expression of Hevli HaMashiach. That is a uh, expression the rabbis use. It's like the painful birth of Mashiach? Yeah. Not his birth. That's what we mean. Oh. No, no, no. It means that his arrival is like a birth. The world is going to go through a birthing process where things are going to get more difficult and more challenging until his arrival. Yeah. Isn't that why a lot of people thought that Mashiach was coming after the Holocaust? Most like, times, yeah. Most times major challenges have come there's been an anticipation of Mashiach's arrival. Yeah. That's usually, unfortunately, what that led to on many occasions, like tons of occasions, is false messiahs. They seem to always pop up when things are difficult. No when things are well. When the galut really, really gets to us, then these false messiahs come. I'm not going to speak too much about false messiahs. We're going to talk about one of them a little bit later. Bar Kochba. We're going to talk about him. But that's going to be for a very, very specific reason as we get there. Okay. Are we good so far? Any questions? Anything we said so far? This is just the introduction. We have a lot more to talk no, about. No. Good. We mustn't say the end of days. You must say the, the I mean, people call it the end of days. I just don't like that expression. It means like the world's going to blow up. Right. right. They have this Christian idea of the rapture that everyone's going to die. Right. And they think everyone's going to die. That's not what's going to happen. Right through history layer, there have been people who come along and said, the end is near, the end is near, we're all going to die. They love it, those people. You know what I'm saying? Actually, they say, one of my friends always said, we hear those people walking the streets right, online saying that. We think the same thing. We're just on mute. I kind of believe the 2012 one yeah. as well. But like, <laughs> um, I just wanted to ask if you were familiar with um, the 
know Bobby Shreve as to fuck the Dog Buster Tent. To to what? It's Yiddish, the Dog Buster Tent. What's it about? It's like about... I don't know Yiddish, you're going to have to translate okay. it. Okay, it means do all that you can. Yeah. And it's basically like the rabbi telling like the people that like everything that like was in like righteous people's power they did and it's basically up to like humankind to... He's written about that continuously. Yeah, Actually, like, every parsha yeah, on the Chumash that I use, he talks about that. Absolutely. I have to use um, one of the Chumashim. Yeah. We're going to see what he's talking about very, very specifically. It's not just like general. There are going to be very specific mitzvot that we can do to bring around the Achishena version. We don't want Be'ito. That's a given. We want Achishena. That's actually what we're working towards. That's the better version, as we're going to see. I'll show you inside. Okay. So this idea of Mashiach's arrival. This idea of Mashiach is not some voluntary thought, not some optional idea. It is one of the 13 principles of faith that the Rambam brings down. And the Rambam is strong in this. And remember, the Rambam is the one who brings down the laws of Mashiach, Hilchot Mashiach, which you already mentioned is in the laws of kings, Hilchot Malachim, because Mashiach is going to be a king. Royalty and majesty are going to return to the Jewish people. Let's see the Rambam's words. You've heard it before and definitely sung it before. Anima amin bemun shalema. We have absolute emuna based upon the words of the prophets. But Mashiach, the Mashiach is going to come. And even though he tarries, though there's a delay, and we're going to see why there is, Im with all that, Achakelo, I'm going to anticipate the Mashiach's arrival, Bocholium, every single day, Shiava. Every single day, there has to be an anticipation. The Gemara in Shabbat, I believe, tells us, I should know that, that there are six questions we're asked when we leave this world in Gan Eden. And one of them is, did you look forward and anticipate the arrival of Mashiach? That's difficult to do. However, fortunately, the rabbis, the Anche, Knesset Gadola, when they wrote down the Amidah, they put inside that a lot about us anticipating and looking forward to the Rav Mashiach. Actually, there's like four or five brachot that actually reference and talk about the Rav Mashiach. Half of your Amidah, the latter half, before you get to the final section, all about the coming of Mashiach. You say that every day? Wow, that's very impressive. It is, it is listed over there at the end of Shachrit. Okay, so what's going to happen to your Siddur? <laughs> Forget your Siddur. Let's talk about your Tanakh is going to change. The answer is absolutely. Tanakh is going to change completely. There's only one book of prophets we're going to have. Why? Why would Tanakh change? Because. That's a great question. I'll give you the short answer, but we're going to look a little more. Nach, Nvi'im, that we have in today's Tanakh, right? <coughs> are all about the arrival of Mashiach. Therefore, we're not going to need those prophecies anymore because they would have been fulfilled. In other words, there were many, many prophets, the Gemara, the Gemara Megillah tells us, there were a million prophets in Jewish history, right? And every street corner, you had different levels of Nebuchadnezzar, different levels, like, different levels of intelligence. There were schools of prophecy. You would go and like work just so you grow in intelligence, you grow in prophecy. We don't have those prophecies anymore because they were fulfilled and they're not needed. So too, Mashiach comes, we're not going to need, the Rambam's going to say this, Lahalacha actually, that we're not going to need the books of the Prophet, except the Torah we need, obviously. He does make one exception that we are going to need afterwards. Anybody know what that is? Megillat Esther. Megillat Esther is a book, and we'll see why that particular book, you can start to figure out a little bit, that's going to exist after Mashiach's arrival. But Mashiach's going to be like, I'm here, those prophecies were fulfilled, because Mashiach's going to tell us, and we're not going to need those books anymore. Well, no. They're actually all about Galut and the arrival of Mashiach. Once he comes, you don't need them anymore. They're there to strengthen us, to give us chizuk, to explain to us things we shouldn't do, things we should do in order to bring Mashiach. Once he comes, we don't need them. It's a Galut mentality that makes us, yeah, we still need that. You know? It's fascinating. We'll see more about it, and we'll see why Megillah Tester. And next semester, there'll be an entire class on Megillah Tester as well, which I give, if you're interested. Okay. Page 52. Let's have a look. Says the Rambam on his commentary to the Mishnah. 
remember, when you study Mashiach, you've got to study the Rambam. You can't escape. He's all over the place. You've got to believe the Mashiach will be better and greater and more honorable than all the kings who have ever been. Miolam, forever. Just like all the prophets prophesied from the days of Moshe Rabbeinu. And that's an interesting statement because we're going to see Mashiach and Olam Haba is not mentioned explicitly in the five books of Moses. Why? We're going to give it four or five reasons as to why that is. But he is hinted at in there. Ad Malachi. Who was Malachi or Malachi? He was the last prophet. And that's the last book of prophecy. So from the beginning to the end, they're all talking about Mashiach. they got tons to say. And whoever doesn't, who doubts this and doesn't, uh, and denies all these prophecies about Mashiach, okay, they are denying the entire Torah. So there have been Jewish movements through the years who have denied the Rav Mashiach, ah, that's not really part of our tradition. I mean, there's Jewish movements today, right, who say this. According to the Rambam and others, actually he goes, he doubles down on this a little bit later. He's going to say these people cannot even be counted among the Jewish people. They are still Jewish, but the mitzvot of v'yahavta l'recha kamocha may not even apply to those individuals, which is a big statement we're going to see. Okay? It's because they removed this concept because it's number 12 of 13 principles of faith. Ikre ha'emunah. Just for what's number 13 if Mashiach is number 12? Resurrection of the dead. Resurrection of the dead. That's right. That's right. Which is a different topic which we'll be doing right at the end. The two overlap. But Mashiach is one thing and Tchat is another. We have tons written on Mashiach. Before he comes, while he comes, after he comes, there's a lot. We have Tanakh, we have Nevi'im, Rishonim, everyone's got their own opinions. Tchatamitim, very little is written. The prophet says, Ayn Lora. The prophet never really saw what it was about. It's mentioned, Ezekiel the prophet, we're going to see, talks about it, but it's really not too much. Okay? And that's what the Rambam says in Hilchot Malachim. Anyone, Vachom Mishenu Mamin, but does not believe in the coming of Mashiach, or Mishenu Machake. And you don't anticipate his arrival. You're not going against just the prophets. You're going against everything. It's not like, well, you know, just forget the books of the VM. I'm not believing in that. But I'm still a, you know, a Chumash believer. I'm still a believer in Moshe Rabbeinu in the mitzvot. The Rambam's like, no, the two are synonymous. They go together hand in hand. The coming of Mashiach is deeply connected to everything you see and read in the Torah and prophecy from Moshe Rabbeinu until Malachi. And just, I brought down just one of the brachot in the Shemona Esrei on page 52. And this is another metaphor that is used for the arrival of Mashiach. Et Semach David, the blossoming of David, of Dacha, because we know Mashiach is going to have to be a direct Descendant, Ben Achar, Ben Achar, Ben from David Amelach. And by the way, he's going to have to prove that, which could be a little bit tricky. And we'll see a couple of potential options to do that, but he's going to have to do that. But the blossoming of Mashiach, the Karno Tarum And his Karno actually means his Karen is his power. If you remember, the way that Mashiach was anointed was he used to fill up a horn, a Karen, with olive oil and would pour it on his head in the shape of a crown. Yeah? And that's what we're praying for every day. Because every day we pray for the Yeshua, the arrival of Mashiach. God sprouts and blossoms the power of redemption. Okay, it's just one of the bracha. Okay, we say every single day. People don't realize what they're reading, but that's actually it. And in Kaddish, According to the Nusach Sfarad and Sfardim, not the Ashkenazim, but there's an extra line over there, which is V'yamlech Malchotei V'yitzmach Porkaneh. There's a lot of Tzmach, Tzemach, right? V'yikarev Mishichei. He should bring closer his Mashiach. 
Leia, what's on your mind? Rabbi, what's going to be our purpose in Mashiach's time? And also, like, is, the li- is life going to go on? Like, are people still going to work? Like, I, like the, I, I'm, don't get me wrong, I want Mashiach to come, but it also, it's like, it's a little bit of a scary concept. Like, what, like, the whole point of, like, is wrestling with the unknown, and that's what asks us questions and brings us closer to faith. So if everything's known, like, what are we going to be, like, grappling with? What's going to give us purpose? Okay. Very, very good. We're going to see two opinions as to what the world's going to be like afterwards. We're going to see the Rambam and others, and the Kabbalists, the rashness of the Kabbalists, if you want. I don't, I don't like those terms, but that's basically it. Even the question itself, which everyone asks, shows that we're like stuck in this gulp mentality. It's like a person who is born in a jail, because their parents were, I don't know, in jail, and they're like sitting in this cell, and they make a life for themselves, and they turn around, Leia, and they say, well, you're telling me there's a whole world outside? But that's like, it sounds terrible and scary. But here we are in the cell. We get three meals a day and everything's great. Why would I want to go outside and experience that? I mean, I heard stories of what it's going to be like and explanations. But really, is that really what I want? Or maybe an even better analogy. You have a child in the womb, right? Or twins, if you will. And they're having an argument. One's like, why would I want to go out? And the other one's like, because there's a whole world out there. But everything I have is here. I'm warm and protected. Everything's great in here. So we have this limited vision of what the world is going to be like when Mashiach comes. We all have this dark vision of like where we are right now as opposed to what could be. We're trapped in this gullet. Men- We're talking about a gullet mentality, an exile mentality. That's what it's talking about. The rabbis tell us that it's going to be difficult to get to that point, to break out, to give birth. To break out of this jail is going to be difficult because we've been so used to this world for so long. But ultimately, it's the greatest good because it's the end. It's the culmination and it's the perfect ending to all of world history. The more we learn about it, the more we'll appreciate actually it's going to sound really, really good. And there will be a purpose at that point. It's going to be different to what our purpose is right now. I really like that. Thank you. We'll discuss this more. We will discuss this more. Okay, let's have a look at Rav Sadia Gaon, the Gaonim with the generation before the Rishonim, like the 900s or so. So their words stand strong, right? Page 53. Says Rav Sadia Gaon, the fact of our redemption by Mashiach is undeniable, he says. Shur Shagulu Chayab Mifanim Marabim for many reasons. Mehem, among them. We saw that all the miracles that performed by Moshe Rabbeinu. And he informed us of Mashiach's arrival and he spoke about it. It wasn't explicitly put in the Torah, but we'll see it was hinted at. And from him and Yeshaya Navi and all the other prophets that God sent to us, they all come along and confirm this idea. We also believe that God is just, wants the best for us in the world. And after we've been through so much suffering, it doesn't make sense that there wouldn't be a good time at the end where we wouldn't have to deal with anti-Semitism and hatred and wars because they're all going to disappear. There will be no more war. Actually, according to the Rambam, the major difference between before Mashiach comes and after Mashiach comes, as we'll see, is no more war. Now, just think about all the resources that are used throughout the world to finance and the brain power to keep going the whole military industrial complex, all the wars out there. Imagine all that's gone, all that could be channeled towards the good. And you've got got trillions of dollars right there. And that's the end of world hunger, just not of itself. Just on a rational level. Forget all the mystical versions, right? That we can look at just that alone. right? It makes sense that the world can't be, this can't be the end, what we see around us right now. It's got to be that there's got to be all the suffering, all the challenge. There's got to be a reason why and a purpose to it. That's really where Rav Sadi Ga'on is, uh, is going on. Yeah? Okay. Having said all that, let's figure out who Mashiach is. Now, we mentioned last class that the name Mashiach is not going to be his name. It's not going to be his name. We started this, we didn't finish it. Mashiach means anointed, does not mean the saviour. He's the anointed one because he's going to be a king. 
because they would take Shem and Zayat and pour it onto his head. It's just a system of raising that. But that's why oil always rises to the top. So to this person who's going to rise to the top and be a great leader. And that's actually the definition of Mashiach that Rashi gives us on the prophecy of Isaiah, chapter 61, verse 1. He says, En Mashiach zu, this Lashon of Mashiach, Ela Lashon Srara Ugadula, is a term of leadership and greatness. He is going to be a leader and he is going to be great. He's not going to be some academic who no one knows about, right? He just sits there studying all day. He is going to be a very powerful and wise and prophetic world leader. We're going to see that Navua prophecy is going to return before Mashiach's arrival. And once he comes, it's going to become very commonplace. Okay, that's going to see the prophecy we'll see of Joel a little bit later. Hmm? Okay. I have heard of him. There are many, many great heroes and heroines throughout Jewish history. Many of them could have had the potential to be Mashiach, but we don't stop and point at a person and say that's Mashiach. That is a challenge that can lead to a lack of faith. Even predicting Mashiach's arrival is discouraged greatly. Having said that people have done it. Okay? But yeah, they're great people. But we're going to see he's going to have to do a number of things in order to be Mashiach. There's a checklist the Rambam's going to give us. Okay. Oh, he's going to be recognized by everybody. Not just the Jewish, but the entire world, yeah. So there's going to be a natural way and there's going to be a miraculous way. Those are the two versions based upon the Be'ito or the Achishana. Yeah, Ron, we're going to see that inside. From now, you're going to say, tell all this to your friends and family and your students one day, God willing, but you are going to be, do it from the sources, not from, uh, from hearsay, yeah. The Rambam was not enough. There was no Navu in the days of the Rambam. Yeah, exactly. So why do we use his like, checklist as, like, how do we trust Very, very good. Like, very good. By the way, it's a big, big deal. First of all, he's the only one who gave us Hilchot Mashiach. Second of all, he brought laws for all of Judaism. Hilchot Yom Kippur. It's also important, right? He gave his version. People got very upset in his day. They used to burn his books. Like, who were you to come along and dismiss, right? Everything comes before and say, this is the Halakha. But history has decided very, very clearly the Rambam is the most kadosh. And the, uh, the Shulchan Aruch is based upon, to some degree, the writings of the Rambam. So he's not saying this of his own volition. This is coming from the Gemara and the Nevi'im. Everything the Rambam says is coming from the prophets. All of it. Amen. So it's not like he just thought of like a bunch of good Mm-mm-mm. Not at all. He didn't just think it up and like, well, here's my opinion. Yeah. He's basing it upon his calculation. Now, others may disagree. And it tells it as long as it doesn't go against the words of the prophets. Okay, let's look at the name Mashiach. So he said Mashiach is not his name. It is a title. It's given to other people as well. There was a Kohen Mashiach, actually. He was the anointed Kohen. He used to go and lift up the spirits of the Jewish troops and soldiers before they went to war. So it just means a person with a very high position of power who has a very specific mission. Having said that, the Gemara tells us something fascinating and it says there are four possible names of Mashiach. Now, even that statement needs understanding. But let's have a look at the four names of the possible Mashiach. And I brought down the Gemara in Sanhedrin. And by the way, Mashiach is probably being discussed in the tractate of Sanhedrin because we're going to have to have a Sanhedrin established before Mashiach comes to actually verify and agree that this is Mashiach. So that's why Sanhedrin, right, that large court of leading scholars who are going to have to come along and finally verify that this is Mashiach. Possibly test him as well, but we'll come to some tests he may have to go through in order to get the job. Mao Shemo, what is the name of this Redeemer that we talk about? 
the court and the students of Rabbi Shila says his name is Shila. Shilo is his name. Shilo. That was the opinion of Rabbi Shila. So his name is Shilo. And that actually is, is a potential name of Mashiach. Shilo. Yeah, very similar to the name of the rabbi. So the students of Rabbi Shila said his name is Shilo. Shilo is his name. That's interesting. That he's got a very similar name to the rabbi, the students of the study house of Rabbi Shila. That's interesting. According to the students of Rabbi Yanai, there's another place. His name is Yinun. Yinun. So we have Shiloh is a possible name, and Yinun is a possible name. Okay. There are those that say his name is Hanina. Whose opinion is it that his name is Hanina? The students of Rabbi Hanina. Yeah. Weird, right? It's getting very unusual. Hold on, I haven't finished yet. It's going to get weirder. And there are those that say his name is Menachem. Menachem. Okay. Those are the four possible names of the Gemara of... So first we've got to figure out what does that mean, his name? What do we, what do we care what his name is? His, his name is, I don't know, Albert, Harry... Why do we even care what his name is? That's number one. Number two, you can't stop but look at this Gemara and be like, why did the students, why did the students seem to think that Mashiach is somehow connected via a name to their own rabbi? That's another question we've got to figure out over here. And then we've got to see what these names, because names, as we said, means something very, very specific, yeah. I think that they think that whatever the quality Very, very good. So the qualities of Shiach has the qualities of their rabbi. Why is that important? Why is that important? Just say he's got, that's like, not the qualities of my rabbi. My rabbi is a, a master of halakha, but not a leader. Why do they see the qualities? Why is that so important that they saw the qualities <laughs> of their rabbi, God bless you, in Mashiach. Why is that? I mean, that's what we're saying over here, right? What qualities are we talking about? That's another thing we've got to figure out. There's a lot of stuff happening over here. Well, what does Menachem actually mean? To console. To give Nechama, to console. So Mashiach, this person is going to console us and console the world after... Thousands of years. What Shiloh? Adjavo Shiloh. Actually, this is one of the names of Mashiach mentioned in the Torah. When Yaakov Avinu blessed his sons, and Yaakov was one of the few people who knew the arrival date of Mashiach. This is the expression he used. Adjavo Shiloh. When you read it, you're like, I don't know what he's talking about. Some person. It's actually referring to Mashiach. It's the only name of Mashiach that we explicitly see in the Torah. By the way, was Yaakov permitted to reveal the end of days? No. To No, he wasn't. It was closed off from That's why the two parashat of Ayachin and Shomar are closed off. Because that level of Nebuah was suddenly closed off him. But he knew. There's one other person, one other Navi, who knew the arrival date of Mashiach. And his name was Daniel. Daniel of the lion's den fame also knew the arrival date of Mashiach. By the way, the others say, by the way, Yaakov knew it. His father Yitzhak and Avram Vin also knew it as well. But that's not explicitly mentioned. This is. What does Shiloh mean? It's a beautiful name, by the way. There are Israeli kids with this lovely, lovely name. Shiloh. Shai Lo. We'll put it with a vav, but it sounds the same. What's Shai? A gift. A present, yeah. What does that mean? He's going to be a gift to the world. And people are going to bring him gifts. I mean, there's many more interpretations, but that's basically it. 
Shaila, right? When you're a, a great king or a queen, people bring you gifts. Just visit the Tower of London, right? David Melech, Shlomo Melech received tons of gifts and gave a lot of gifts as well. And was his level of, nev- of nevu and greatness and chokhmah was a gift to the world. So Shai Lo. Yanun. Gift to him. Shai is a gift. What's Yanun? So Yin means fish. There's going to be a explosion. Explosion. A world population explosion before he comes. There's going to be a lot of goodness in the world. This is fish. A lot of goodness in his days. Yeah, so the word yin is inside that thing, it means fish, and yanun means a lot, of, a lot of people are going to come to the world, and a lot of goodness is going to be here as well, because fish are a sign of goodness and plentifulness. Because there's a lots of them, and they were given an extra bracha at creation. Actually, the word bracha appears for the first time, or it's shoresh, barach, in relation to the fish, because God had to bless the fish. That's why the fish were not affected by the mabul, by the flood, all right? And they always have lots of, because a lot of oceans that need to be filled. And therefore, they were given extra. So fish is always a representation of plentifulness. That's why Negadai Nara, they use fish eyes. Yeah. Could be. Could be. A lot of uh, Eastern religions and non-Eastern religions will take ideas from Judaism. Yeah. Actually, con- all the concepts, actually, of Judaism. Yeah. That's what they're founded upon, aren't they? Yeah. Oh, they could have known that. Listen, they could have known exactly when that date was. They could have known it. But if you're saying that there's specific mitzvahs that we could do to make it come faster, but they know when it's coming, then it's not. They're going one. To you're gonna have to say they're one step ahead. They knew. They were privy to that date. Maybe the Beito date. I don't know, but they knew. But we know the Beito date. Oh, it's not conclusive that the Beito date is six thousand. Right, but Ito could actually be a little bit over for that. But Ramban and others say it is. But they knew that final time. They knew what world history was going to be like, and they knew the final arrival date of Mashiach. Not the Akushana. Could be. We don't know. Could be. We don't know. It was the whole thing. We, we weren't informed. Right. It was hidden from us. And Hanina was Hanina. Good name. And a, actually, my good friend's name. What's Hanina? Merce, but Chain. What's Chain? Mm. If someone's got chen, it's almost untranslatable, but we're going to have to. It's like a certain grace and charm. Very charming person. People are going to be very, very much attracted. This is person is going to bring people back. All the Jews and not everyone's going to flock to this person. Extreme charm and chen. Right? And it's a chen that comes from HaKadosh Baruch Yeah. That what? Is it going to be like a problem that like maybe people are going to think that sh- like Hashem doesn't exist because Mashiach has blood? Not at all. Not at all. Other religions try to, to add Mashiach to God. He's not God in any way, shape, no, or form. Saying, because he's going to do all these things, are people going to start thinking, ah. No, 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 no. The na- like, that's his exact, his whole mission is to, and we'll see the words of the prophets, to allow the name of God to cover the entire world just as the oceans cover the world, says the prophet. So too. The knowledge of God is going to cover the entire earth. So that's his job. That, he's specifically going to be doing that. A misuse of this kind of power we're talking about is a dictator who n- makes the name of God disappear, like Nimrod. What did Nimrod do? He built the Tower of Babel in order to remove the name of God from this world. That's a misuse of charismatic powers. So it's the exact exact opposite. I just want to come back to this because I, I want don't let the class finish without this understanding. So what were these students saying? Oh, so we have two opinions by the way, before we even get there. One opinion is these are actually his names, but most say no. It doesn't mean his name is. It means that his mission, because your name is your mission, right? Neshama, soul has the word shame in it we discussed before. 
So your name is your mission. We see here, partly, part of the mission statement of Mashiach, based upon Mem Shin Yud Chet. We're seeing his mission is in his name. Oh, wait, that's spelled out his name? Yeah, oh. Mashiach. <laughs> that's the whole point, yeah. That's We're so seeing cool. his mission in his name. <laughs> right? Menachem, Shiloh, Yunun, and Hanina. That's what the Mara is saying. What did these students, what did these students, why did these students, I should say, see their rabbi name in Mashiach's name? Because remember, everyone is going to accept Mashiach. And you have all different types of Jews and all different schools of thought. So they were like, they will be able to connect to Mashiach and be like, oh, he's just like my teacher. He's like my rabbi. They didn't see their rabbi as Mashiach. They saw, they realized that there were qualities of Mashiach that they will see in the rabbi, so we're all going to agree. It's not like one little small sect among the Jewish people are going to be like, ah, yeah, 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 that's my rabbi right there. Right? And Mashiach, only I'm going to be able to relate to him and feel connected to him. That's not the truth at all. Everyone is going to feel that the relationship that they have towards their own rabbis, leaders, and teachers in Mashiach as well. We see this with one other historical character. One second, stay girl, I'm going to get you in a second, my dear. Hold that question. We see some other historical character that we've kind of hinted at already today, where we see this idea of everybody seeing themselves in this person. And that was actually crucial for this person's mission to be fulfilled. You know who that is? Esther. Very good. Esther Malka. Ah. Remember, she hid her identity, right? Why? So everyone's like, oh, she's from my nation, right? She's uh, from Yemen. She's from Africa. Everyone felt as though, now she needed to have that because she had to attract people and get their support. It knows to fulfill a mission. Therefore, when it came to the Purim story, which, by the way, is a microcosm of the Messianic revelation, it's all part of that as well. So just like they saw themselves in it, that's why she couldn't reveal her origins. Well, probably they would have found out she was Jewish, would have killed her, right? Or not accept her as a queen. Besides that problem, everyone had to feel as though, oh, she's from us. So she wasn't limited. Everyone felt that, and that was part of her success, was she was able to relate to everyone, no matter where they came from, no matter what language they spoke, what nation they were from as well. So these are traits, and everyone... When we should, Punchline is, when Mashiach comes, everyone, may take a little time to get there, is going to agree that that's Mashiach. That is Mashiach, yeah. What's the Ben Chizkiah part of, of Menachem? Oh, that's the part, Menachem Ben Chizkiah. What does that mean? Like, they I'm s- assuming it sounds more like a specific name than an attribute. Well, it could be. It could be. Or maybe the son of Chazak, I'm not sure. I have to look into it, I'm not sure. Yeah. Um, are these all passes or is there only one of each one? No, no. So two opinions. Some say this actually could be his name. No, no, no. It doesn't mean his name. These are attributes oh. that we're going to see in him and his days. This is what he's going to bring to the world because your name represents your mission. And most people, as far as I've seen, uh, agree that that's really what it is. Yeah. Can you just repeat the English? So Menachem is to console. Shiloh is a gift. Shiloh. It's a name, but that's kind of what's inside there. Yunun, if you look in the books, the future book, I think I brought down that it means it's fish in there and it's going to be a lot of goodness that's going to come. And Hanina means the grace from God. Right? He's going to have a godly gift to attract people because he's a leader. People are going to have to follow him. He's got to be some weird like, character that people can't relate to. He's going to have to bring the entire world. You know? You can't be a great leader unless you're leading by power and control, which he's not going to do. He's going to lead by the word of God. Very, very important. Yeah. So there are different things being said about Mashiach and his name. So when Mashiach comes, if good things don't happen, will people like turn away from believing him? No. Before Mashiach comes, we're going to see a turn away and then a return, as Malachi, the prophet, is going to tell us, but not based upon these names. Yeah. And like different ways, like he's gonna come or things just like I don't know, like things are gonna happen 
What things? I don't know, but I feel like... So he says, you don't know. So we're going to look at what those things are. We're going to look at the words of the prophets and see what they... We're going to see what those words are. They must have... The good things must happen. The bad things do not need to happen at all. Well, not the question. It's the end of the VM. They must happen. And I think the other things aren't true also. Let's have a look what those things are, and then you can make your own decision. Let's do it that way. Let's have a look. We don't know where they are yet. There's a number of things beforehand. A list that Mishnah tells us the world's going to be like beforehand. When you read this list, it's literally like reading, you know, 2022, 2023. It's unbelievable. But we're going to get there. So hold on. I hear your question. I can't bring everything down now, but I'm going to show you eventually. Yeah. Um, so your name is Mashiach. What do you think that says about your mission? About a person's mission? Everyone's name reflects, reflects a person's mission. Everyone's name reflects their mission. If your name is Hannah, you're a Hannah person. If your name is Shoshana, you're a Shoshana person. Everyone's name reflects part of their mission. Yeah. <coughs> that means your name speaks about you. Everyone's name was given to them by Ruach HaKodesh. The Arizal says that. You don't name your kids. You're given a certain of Nevuah prophecy that comes to you. And um, that's why everyone has inside them their mission in code. Like a barcode of lines comes and like bleeps up all the information you need on the screen. When the red light goes over it, same too with the person's name. That means your mission, we spoke on reincarnation. It could well be. It could well be that you're taking part of their neshama. Because remember, reincarnation doesn't mean your entire neshama. Reincarnation means a part of the neshama and continuing that person's mission for them to some degree. It could be that. Yeah. Or, if you're not hold by that, then you're just, you know, remembering them via their name. You can go with both, yeah. Okay. So, the world... Is going to change once Mashiach comes. Different opinions of what it's going to be like. The things beforehand, for the most part, are bad things which don't need to happen. Every negative prophecy in Tanakh does not need to happen because we can do Teshuvah and get rid of the bad prophecy. Like Jonah was told to tell people of Nineveh, Hashem's going to destroy them. And he goes, says, We're going to, you're all going to die, says God. And they're like, We're going to do Teshuvah. Is that nothing you can do about it? And they did Teshuvah, he didn't destroy them. So negative prophecies don't need to happen. Positive prophecies do. So that we have to look at what those po- positive prophecies actually are when it comes to Mashiach. But these are all great, valid questions, but we're going to get through them. More. I'm going to show you all these things inside. Do not, do not worry. Wait, about what you just said, I about, gotcha. About the, the negative prophecies, can't you make the same argument for the opposite, that like, if there's a positive prophecy and like, we're like a terrible generation and like, we do awful things... Then, like, <laughs> oh, it may be delayed. Oh, yeah. Maybe you know my memory, but it's definitely going to happen. When it happens and how it happens, we're going to see with the Rav and Mashiach, we're going to see there's one version which is really not very nice and one which is much, much better. But it's, it's not possible that, like, we just make the problem. No, 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 no. Absolutely not. It must happen. It's a given. It's a postulate. It's a given. Let's look at the words of the Rambam. So let's go forward. Now we're in the Rambam's days. And let's see what the Ramah has to say about all this. We're on page 55. Or for you, Hamsa Hamsa. There you go. Okay, so this is the Rambam and his commentary on the Mishnah in Sanhedrin. And he says, Aval, Yomota Mashiach, which we now know what it means, right? The time frame that Mashiach. Huzman Shabotachsa Malchot Israel. Malchot? Royalty, majesty is going to return to the Jewish people in the land of Israel. By the way, for that to happen, you're going to have to assume you've got a lot of Jews living in Israel. Right? Because you can't be a king of a nation when there ain't no one there. So we're going to have to have sovereignty over all of Israel before Mashiach can come. Looking good so far, right, friends? Looking good. For 2,000 years, it wasn't looking good. Now it's looking good. The Yachzerul Eretz Yisrael. And there's going to be a return of the Jewish people to the land of Israel. The Yo'oto HaMelech, every word he's saying is precious, my friends. The Yo'oto HaMelech, and this king, HaOmed Makom Malchuto Tzion. He's going to make his Makom Malchuto, which basically means his, the center of his 
leadership, his royalty, his palace in Zion. In Zion. What is Zion? What does that word even mean? Zion, Zionist. What is Zion? So this term used to refer to, was actually a term coined by David and Melech. It may have existed before, but he took this word and it refers to Yerushalayim. Actually, I think it referred, first of all, to Harabayat, to the place of the Mikdash that he was hoping his son would build, which he did. Then it refers to all Yerushalayim. And nowadays it refers to all of Israel, the land of Israel. Yeah? And if you're a lover of Israel, you're a Zionist. Okay, so this is actually a reference to Mashiach basing himself not in Canada or China or Elat. He's going to have to build his whole center of operations in Yerushalayim, in Zion. As a side point, and you're going to love this, the word Zion comes from the word Mitsuyan. What's Mitsuyan? Excellent, Excellent. remarkable. What? Remarkable. The word Sion is related to the word Mitsuyan, which is remarkable and amazing. A Sion is also an object. Now that I'm thinking about it, what is a Sion? It's actually an object. That's an Ari. What's a Sion? You ever go to a Kever? A Kever, you go to a burial place? And they have a Sion. What is it, Sion? It's the marker, right? It's the tombstone. Also, by the way, known as a nefesh, because a person's nefesh is also still connected to that place. But that's a side point. It's called the Sion. It's the marker. This is the place. This is the place. So Sion is basically a sign of it's going to be remarkable. And this is the place where all the action is going to be taking place. Literally. Keep going. This is good stuff in the Rambam. V'yit gadel shemo. His name is going to become very great. V'yagia l'ktsei tevel. And he's going to travel. He's going to be extremely famous. Everyone is going to know about Mashiach. Yoter, even more. V'gadol al mamlechet shlomo. Shlomo Melech was mega famous. Everyone came from all over the world. Who doesn't know about King Solomon and his wisdom? He was like mega, mega famous. You know? He was the king of fame and success and greatness. And yet, Mashiach is going to be more famous and more well known. Instantaneously, by the way. Which now we understand, right? I mean, look at it through today's eyes. You can get fame in one moment. Helpful that. Helpful that. Vayichratu imah min brit shalom. And all the nations of the world are going to make a brit shalom, a peace pact. Meaning they're not going to attack. There's going to be absolute peace, just like they made with Avram Avinu and with Moshe Rabbeinu and with Yoshua at different times. So too, there's going to be a peace pact made with those nations. And that's actually a reference, I think, to absolute peace throughout the world, no more war, which we'll see other prophecies that back that up. Yeah. So when people say that, like, Messiah is coming soon, it's referring to the nature of peace. Yes. It helps. Ronnie, it helps. Absolutely. Absolutely. How long do we have? What time does this class finish? 40. Okay, good. Let's just do one last piece. And then, uh, so we're going to do the last piece is in Hilchot Teshuvah. The laws of repentance. Does anyone know why the Rambam, in his laws of repentance, is suddenly talking about Mashiach? I mean, I hear the laws of kings. Maybe the laws of, I don't know, Israel and Shemitah and Yovel and Beit HaMikdash. There's laws of Beit HaBechira. Why is he talking about Mashiach and the laws of repentance? Why is he even mentioning that? Yeah. Is it like, like the first step going I think it could be as easy as that, like we were saying. It could be that what's going to bring Mashiach is Teshuvah. We'll see a very specific type of Teshuvah, by the way. There's general Teshuvah, which is always a good thing, 
but in certain areas, specific, certain mitzvot, and certain averot we have, is going to bring Mashiach. So one of the catalysts to bring the Achishena version is going to be Teshuvah. Let's look at the Ramam's words. You take it for himself. I remember, when you tell these ideas to your friends and family and your students one day, Mitz Hashem, don't say Rabbi Hajjaf told me. They don't know who the heck I am. Say it's the Rambam. Black and white. Hamelach Shiamon Mizera David. This king who is going to stand from the seed of David, i.e. a direct descendant. He's going to be Ben Achar Ben Achar Ben Achar Ben of David and Melech. Baal Chochmah is going to be extremely wise. Yoter Mishlomo. Wiser than Shlomo Melech. The Navigador. Not only wise, he's going to have Nevoah, Karov. What does Karov mean? Close. Lemosh Rabbeinu. Oh, that's a bit of a limit. I mean close to. Why close to Moshe Rabbeinu? Because Moshe Rabbeinu's prophecy is the greatest prophecy that ever existed. So the Rambam can't contradict another principle of faith that he listed, which is the prophecy of Moshe Rabbeinu is the greatest and no one can exceed it. Others disagree, because they can, and they say no. Mashiach's prophecy will be greater than, Mashiach, than Moshe Rabbeinu. By the way, what is Moshe Rabbeinu's prophecy? Where do we see that? Where's Moshe Rabbeinu's prophecy? Where's that written? <laughs> the Torah. <laughs> no. that, that's the prophecy of Moshe Rabbeinu, the five books of Moses. Oh, right. Thanks for that. <laughs> so no one can supersede that. He's going to be karam with Moshe Rabbeinu. So... The Torah is non-nullifiable. Okay. Lefikach yelamed kol ha'am. Therefore, he's going to teach the entire nation. He's going to teach the way of God. That's his main job. To teach. He can't replace God because he's going to teach them about God. V'yavok kol ha'goyim and all the nations of the world are going to come l'shomo to hear him. Shinamar. And now the Rambam is going to quote Isaiah the prophet, chapter 2, verse 2 to 3. V'yabachot yamim is going to be the end of days. Achorit yamim. Right? Or the world to come. Nachon Yer Har Beit Hashem. Rosh Harim. It's going to be established. The bite of God. The temple on the mountains. Venisa Migva'ah. Venaru Alav. Kolagoyim. And all the nations of the world are going to literally stream to Mashiach. V'halchu Amim Rabim. And the many nations are going to come. V'amru. Lechu. Let us go. V'naleng. Go up. Go up where? To Yerushalayim, right? We said we already discussed Israel, and Yerushalayim is higher, right? And the Beit Hamidrash is going to be on Temple Mount, higher still, building the third and final Beit Hamidrash on Temple Mount. It's going to be a little bit tricky, considering you can't even pray up there right now, but okay, I have theories for future classes. But now let's go up El Har Hashem to the house of God, to the mountain of God, El Beit Eloke Yaakov, to the house of the God of Jacob, mentions Yaakov, because he's the one who had the prophecy about Mashiach, and he's the one who went to Harabite, and his descendants are going to be the ones who greet Mashiach, midirachav and nelcha barachatav, and let's go follow in his paths. So this is Jews and non-Jews. The entire world, according to the Rambam, are going to be impacted by the fame and the charm and the greatness of Mashiach. Wow. Questions? We did a lot today. Questions on anything we discussed? Yeah? Yeah, just a little further back, the sounds like when, wait, right before Mashiach comes, we're going to have that whole, like, crazy, chaotic, whatever. Where do um, I say that? Not, like, 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 some, like the Don't best, misquote me, Anya. No, I'm not. I'm paraphrasing it. But, um, like, the whole crazy, not war, but, like, just, like, struggle before he comes. Yeah, it's going to be struggling, challenging yeah. Mashiach comes, yeah. Yeah, so you said it was going to be, like, physical, mental.